In the laser industry, specifically. It has changed dramatically. The field of biophotonics was just getting started. The first instrument that I bought was a microwave spectrum analyzer. It's time to shed light on our universe. This is All Things Photonics, a podcast about the physical science of light. Join us as we explore the latest in lasers, optics, spectroscopy, and microscopy. Each episode, you'll hear from leading voices from across the photonics landscape. We're brought to you by Photonics Media. This is Associate Editor Joel Williams. Here are this week's top stories. A team at Columbia University has introduced a way to program a layered crystal in such a way that it is able to open doors to imaging capabilities beyond common limits on demand. The technique exerts control over nanolight, light that is able to access the nanoscale, providing insight into the field of optical quantum information processing. Collaborating researchers from Tokyo University of Science, National Cancer Center Hospital East, and Riken Center for Advanced Photonics have developed a technology using near-infrared hyperspectral imaging and machine learning that finds hidden tumors, such as those in deep tissue and or covered by a mucosal layer. Researchers from the University of Stuttgart developed a microscale spectrometer that can be fabricated through femtosecond direct laser writing. The angle and sensitive 3D printed miniature spectrometer has a direct separated spatial spectral response in a volume of less than 100 by 100 by 300 cubic micrometers and operates in the visible portion of the spectrum from 490 nanometers to 690 nanometers. Research from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory has yielded a method of compressive image recovery that is trained on patches of images rather than full size images. The method, called GPP for Generative Patch Priors, is able to recover a wide variety of natural images. It compares favorably with other existing methods, the researchers said, in its ability to perform compressive image sensing and complete compressive phase retrieval tasks. And finally, researchers at the University of Southern California developed a method that emits uniform single photons from precisely arranged quantum dots. The advancement benefits from an existing method for intentionally arranging quantum dots that Professor Anupam Madhukar, corresponding author on the latest study, and his team introduced nearly 30 years ago. Up next, news editor Jake Saltzman speaks with Dirk England of the Quantum Photonics Lab at MIT. I'm Joel Williams, and you're listening to All Things Photonics. Today's episode is sponsored by the North American subsidiary of Hamamatsu Photonics. Hamamatsu provides state-of-the-art photonic devices for applications ranging from life sciences to quantum technologies. These devices include PMTs, SPADs, SIPMs, photodiodes, spatial light modulators, image sensors, and cameras. For more information, visit www.hamamatsu.com. Joined today by Dr. Dirk England, Associate Professor in MIT's Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Dr. England is the recipient of the 2012 DARPA Young Faculty Award and the 2012 IBM Faculty Award, as well as the 2017 Adolf Law Medal and a 2018 Bose Research Fellowship. His research focuses on semiconductor quantum devices and systems for quantum communications, quantum sensing, and quantum enhanced sensing. He joins us from MIT's Quantum Photonics Laboratory. How you doing, Dirk? Great, Jake. Great to talk to you. I wanted to, to jump right into it here. We saw a, a pretty significant advance in photonic quantum technology recently here out of a team from the University of Science and Technology of China. Uh, in the final month of 2020, in fact, they introduced a photon-based quantum computer that performed a calculation that would take an ordinary supercomputer Uh, no less than billions of years to achieve. Now, certainly it's not a a perfect demonstration of a quantum advantage. There are challenges forthcoming, no doubt. But the road is a cleaner one now. How impactful is this advance in evolving the quantum narrative? Photonic systems have been viewed as one of the perhaps most promising platforms for 
various kinds of quantum information processing, quantum networks, and, and, in, and in particular also quantum computing. The field has advanced quickly in recent years, um, and this particular experiment that you're referring to was inspired uh, by a paper by Alexei Arkhipov and Scott Aronson in 2011 that introduced an idea for something that a photonic quantum system could do that a classical could not predict, and that was a uh, what they call a boson sampler. What you would do is you would inject bosons, like individual photons, into a large many-mode interferometer, many individual photons. They uh, the paths are mixed in that interferometer, and if that interferometer, the paths are sufficiently randomly mixed, then you can get interesting non-classical interference effects on the output of that many-mode interferometer. And when you detect those photons with single photon detectors, that's boson sampling. And it turns out that predicting that distribution, the probability distribution in that experiment, requires the calculation of some mathematical function, a permanent, that is considered computationally very hard. It, it grows exponentially or faster than exponential. In fact, as a factorial with the size of the input state of photons. Okay. So what that example was, it's an example of a, um, a quantum advantage, quantum computational advantage, something that a quantum device can do that a classical computer cannot do. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a practical use, and we don't, in fact, know the moment of, of a practical application of it. There are, oh, there are some ideas, you know, molecular bond vibrations and so on. But that 2011 paper spurred a lot of uh, experimental activities to then implement it, and now we're fast-forwarding nine years to 2020, when the team of Genway Pan actually demonstrated that experiment with uh, 100 channels, optical channels monitored. And what they showed uh, pretty convincingly is that, uh, that what they are able to measure now not be predicted by a classical computer, even, I mean, even a classical computer, you know, running for millions of years. So I say it's pretty convincing and not absolutely airtight because it still relies on some conjecture about the hardness of the actual sampling problem from particular this, this Gaussian boson sampling, which is a particular variant of the boson sampling that was introduced by uh, Arkhipov and Aronson in 2011. But nonetheless, it's an example of a sampling problem that has some quantum computational advantage, even though we don't know that it has practical uses. That's going to be shown in the next couple of years. So it's going to be interesting to see whether that that device can actually solve things that are of, of practical interest. One other thing I want to relate this to is last year we heard about uh, a big result from Google. It was reported in, I think, October 2019 was when they reported in an article in Nature quantum supremacy, as they call it. That's really another word for quantum computational advantage. And it's actually a, it's a circuit sampling problem. And that experiment was done with fewer number of modes, but I would say both of them are sort of doing sort of the similar type of complexity problem. And, you know, they're, they're both based on the fact that tracking a quantum mechanical state with very large numbers of quantum bits, particles in it, sort of, you know, at the point when you have the 50 particles, that's sort of like you have to track perhaps two to the 50 dimensional space. Uh, then um, that becomes very, very difficult or, in fact, intractable. Okay, so I would say that we have two examples of quantum computational advantage as uh, actually sort of like as the primary target, although there are other systems like cold atom arrays uh, that probably are also at that point, although they haven't, to my knowledge, implemented a, a particular focused complexity argument in the same way in a sort of a circuit sampling method, um, as these other two papers have. As quantum moves on, and as, as innovation advances, uh, it, it shouldn't be lost that this, this realm, I suppose, is characterized here by academic, or academia and industry working together. Um, perhaps more than in other uh, areas and technologies of photonics, and, and government, too, has a role to play. And within that, as a result, you have a lot of startup and spin-out companies. Uh, I'm curious to get your perspective on the significance of this confluence of multiple sectors working together. Uh, that's a great question. 
it's a really, you know, building a quantum computer is really hard. <laughs> and if you think about how classical computers were built, it also required that kind of confluence, right? I mean, classical computers, you know, some of the first ones were commissioned by governments, right? And uh, that built up industry. And then industry started to find applications outside of government, you know, outside of comp- computing the trajectory of projectiles or something, you know, or the weather, as uh, ENIAC was designed to do. And then you, you started to have that sort of, you know, it took off and it, and it, and it began to blossom. But, but uh, it required, um, actually for many decades, and if you think about classic computers, you know, some amount of coordination and collaboration to build that sort of ecosystem. Just to stay on that point a little bit longer, first you have to high quality silicon, right? I mean, the first transistor was built in germanium, but our computers today are largely built on silicon. So we needed better, higher quality silicon in the 1940s that that was developed. And then people learned how to make, you know, a couple of silicon transistors and they could scale them up. Some of the early work at Texas Instruments. And then uh, government, again and again, became involved, for example, in the establishment of the Moses Foundry process uh, in the early 1980s, if I remember correctly. And that then made the advanced uh, electronic components available to the broader community, who would then say, and start, oh, wow, that's awesome. I can start to innovate. Right? I can start to play with this, this, and this. And then you started to see this much bigger ecosystem developing. Okay, so, um, And I think in photonics, we've just, we're seeing the same sort of Thing at the moment in integrated photonics, right, with boundaries uh, over the last decade, a bit more than a decade, popping up and giving these tools to the community. And you see way more, you know, innovation happening. Uh, people are able to build systems, which really before we weren't able to build, right? And uh, my group, for example, you know, a lot of the work that we do is enabled because of these foundries. These foundries, too, are collaborative efforts between government and industry and academia, and photonics is a good example of that. And I think we probably are going to need something like this in quantum as well, all right? Various kinds of collaborations, including things, you know, on the scale of larger centers that really will do things that no individual sector can do by itself, probably. You know, that would probably involve some sort of a foundry or sort of like, you know, some sort of foundry shared effort, right? But it's also going to probably involve large test beds. Uh, the telecom industry benefited from the development of big, you know, test sets to try out new technologies, right? We're going to probably need similar things in the quantum space. So to answer your question, yes, there is, we definitely need that kind of confluence of the different sectors to build an ecosystem. It's such a distinct architecture to, to think about and interesting too, to gear, to, to hear your sense on uh, what it is and where it's going. And in the academia, academia industry partnership to which you've contributed recently, produced ultra-sensitive sensor devices that were capable of detecting microwaves with the highest theoretical possible sensitivity. Uh, there's a lot to unpack here um, from this work in period in nature, by the way. Uh, we're talking about quantum, we're talking about semiconductor-based diodes, graphene. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about this recent work? So this work was done with a fantastic collaborator, uh, Dr. KC Fong at BBN Raytheon Technologies. Um, they have an office uh, here in, in Cambridge, and uh, and and I should give credit to uh, Casey who really led this work. So um, what what this is is a bolometer. Now in a bolometer, right, you um, you have electromagnetic radiation, radiation, for example, impacting on some amount of material. It heats the, it raises the temperature, and then you try to measure the temperature change, right? Operating principle of the bolometer. So uh, what do you want for that? You, A, want to have a very low thermal mass, very low heat capacity, because for a given amount of energy that you put in, you want the highest possible temperature change. B, you want to sustain that temperature change so long as long as you can so that you can have time to measure it. And C, you need to have the lowest possible noise in the readout process, right? Um, and so it turns out that graphene is a pretty good candidate for this. Why? Because when you consider... The graphene electron gas at low temperature is well decoupled from the lattice vibration of the actual carbon atoms. So, um, and you gate graphene so that you have in a couple of mic, you know, in one micron of area, you have just a few electrons zipping around, right? And these electrons, because they're so well decoupled from the environment, that, that actually represents your thermal mass, right? So what you're doing is you, uh, you, you, you know, you have your, 
a very different kind of bolometer than what we've seen in the past. Here, you, your, your bolometer relies on just a few electrons, and their heat capacity is tiny, especially in graphene, because of the density states and the, uh, uh, the uh, band structure of it. The, the heat capacity, in fact, goes to zero, uh, in, in theory. Um, so very, very low heat capacity. And then what you do is you, you, can, uh, you can send in a electromagnetic radiation. And what we did with KC is that electromagnetic radiation was radiation at, at about a, you know, a little less than 100 gigahertz, so in the microwave regime. And we could show that actually that kind of bolometer is sensitive at the single photon level to that uh, radiation. Okay, so this is really the bolometer. Um, but I would say it's just the beginning of something, a, a bigger story here, where we're you know, learning to control electrons sufficiently well that you can make devices that um, we didn't think were possible you know, a couple of years ago uh, before. So the, the next big step here is actually to go down an order of magnitude lower in energy, and we're, we're very sure it's going to be possible so that you could you know, detect uh, single microwave photons below 10 gigahertz, uh, which uh, with, with broadband resolution. I'd say the only way that I know that this is possible today is with, you know, with superconducting circuits, but there's narrow band. Here, being a bolometer, it's actually fully broadband. Speaking uh, with Dirk England here on All Things Photonics today, uh, chipping away on the road to a quantum advantage. And Dirk, you mentioned germanium earlier in passing. Uh, we've just wrapped up a, a, a question and answer here on graphene. Uh, and I want to move into silicon. In your plenary at the Meta 17 conference, uh, you expressed your gratitude, of course, for the pioneers of the field of silicon photonics. And, and I want to get your thoughts on how advances in, in silicon photonics have supported your work and your ability to, to chip away on the road to this quantum advantage. I would say that without foundry processes, today would definitely not be possible. Uh, in my PhD work, when I was a registered student at Stanford, um, I actually did a lot of nanofabrication, uh, including photonic circuits, and know how hard it is to make one device yield. Uh, making a hundred devices, a component yield in one device that's supposed to work, uh, that is very, very challenging in a university clean room. I would say impossible. And so um, what the foundries allow you to do is something that wouldn't be possible in a university clean room and to do it at a cost, moreover, that, uh, that's actually sort of uh, afford, uh, uh, to individual groups. So um, for us, it's been uh, enabling, absolutely. Um, and, uh, and actually led to a couple of, you know, uh, bigger projects in my group, uh, including some, some startups that maybe you will ask me about in a moment. I'm well, glad you bring that up. I want to go there now. Uh, you know, we did mention earlier, and we did talk about earlier, the, the role of startups and how they're forming. Uh, there's one in particular that you're quite familiar with. Can you tell us about Dust Identity and its work? Dust Identity was started by a postdoc of mine, Ophir Gasson, and uh, the original work actually came out of a DARPA program you make a new generation of very good sensors, uh, sensors in this case based on electron spin of, of solids, uh, nitrogen vacancy centers and diamond in particular. So these are very, very sensitive to nearby magnetic fields, nearby temperature changes, and so on. So you can think of it almost like a magic dust that you could incorporate into materials, perhaps into biological samples and so on, as a sensing modality. Over time, we... We learned to make these materials really, really well, and then a new opportunity came along, and so that's an example of always wanting to keep you know, eyes open. And that was the um, well, opportunity and problem. And the problem is uh, supply chain secure. If you buy a modem, for example, it has its components from all over the place, all over the world. It's been you know, built into one system, and when you receive it, you don't know where these components have been. You don't know exactly what's in them, right? So for many applications, uh, you would like to have some sort of a seal, some some way that you can verify where it's been, where it's been assembled, and then been sealed and not opened, right? And you can you want to authenticate also the exact uh, component, right? So what uh, what what we realized at dust um, is that that could be done with these same kinds of diamond nanomaterials because by the of it, but also by the quantum properties of it it's impossible to replicate them. So imagine that you have a lacquer that's been infiltrated with these diamond nanoparticles that have these quantum properties. 
So then at every stage of assembly, you coat your device with more and more layers of lacquer. Then you can look through it, and any at any point, you can verify that that uh, fingerprint was recorded at that particular location at that time in the assembly process. This way, you can authenticate where exactly every device has been and secure your, your supply chain in a way that we didn't know how to do previously. And that's the... Uh, that's the target application that actually Dust is begin is now solving, and you know Ophir and Jonathan Hodges, uh, who's the CTO, and that team uh, has you know largely independent. I, a lot of it I, I just talk to them occasionally and watch how amazing the progress is, but um, but they are working now with several companies that are security sensitive to scale out this technology. And it's it's awesome that in some way I'm able to be part of it because here's an example of something that's a real every you know a real problem for us today, and where quantum and actually sort of a roundabout way unexpectedly is providing a solution for. And it's not the only uh, startup or company uh, with which you're associated. You're a co-founder for QR Computing. Uh, I suppose it's only fair if you tell us a little bit about QR as well. Yeah. So we talked earlier about the. Uh, you know, we touched on a couple of examples of quantum computing platforms. One of the leading ones today that really has the potential now to scale large is neutral cold atoms. So what you do is use laser cooling techniques to cool atoms, in the case of QERA, down to temperatures below microkelvin temperatures. I like to say this is, you know, 10,000 times cooler than a uh, lowest temperature superconductor. Uh, that we've managed I think quantum computers are based on. So very, very low temperature and in other ways room temperature set up. Okay, but these atoms are really low temperature and they're very, very good as storage for quantum memory. And it's possible to interact multiple atoms, uh, the qubits that are encoded in them, using optical techniques. Notice optics comes in all over the place here, from the cooling to the interaction and actually also on the readout, right? Optics, in a way, is your interface. It's your wire, right? It's an optical wire. Uh, that's how we uh, read in information, how we read out information, is quantum memories. And the beautiful thing about these optical wires is that when you don't need them, you can turn them off. They have, you know, they have then no background contamination, no noise, and, uh, and no heating on the, on the atoms. So uh, QERA was founded to take technology that was developed uh, in the laboratory of some of my collaborators, in particular, Misha, Mikhail Lukan at, uh, at Harvard and Marcus Greiner at Harvard and Vladimir Vlutic at MIT, out uh, and translated into a startup environment where you would be very, very focused on you know, building up, uh, scaling these devices up to solve real everyday problems. And where they are today is uh, at, at the scale of, you know, these systems are at the scale of some a hundred, more than a hundred uh, cold atoms, uh, which each you consider as one qubit. So, in, in that sense, it's already at a scale of uh, this quantum computational advantage. Um, but what what the team is really after is to look for a practical quantum computational advantage, something that people really care about, whether it's run on a quantum computer or any other system. And in particular, some of the problems that you might be able to map onto this are network uh, network graph problems. Like um, how to lay out, for example, uh, how to let out uh, lay out telecommunication, wireless communication networks, ad hoc radio networks, um, but th- many other kinds of graph problems as well, like optimization problems, and basically a, a class of problems that today's computers are really bad at solving, but they'd have practical applications. So uh, that field is exciting because it is now a step beyond the boundary of quantum computational advantage. It is exponentially hard and impossible, basically, to simulate these systems. And there is a possibility that they're in the strike zone of discovering uh, real-world use cases for it. We don't yet have one, but there's a good chance that we will discover one or several in the coming years. So uh, definitely an exciting field to watch. I'll be honest with you, you do a, a, a pretty good job of selling the field, not that that's what you're trying to do here, but you, you talk about these high, high-level performing computers and these problems just in need of a solution and vice versa. You, you sort of see the, the appeal. Um, one of the subjects that we have not 
uh, touched on yet here uh, is PICs, and that's something that you and, and your co-authors highlighted in a Nature paper this fall. And we're now at the point where we are tailoring these circuits for highly, highly specific applications, quantum information processing, microwave photonics. Uh, I want to ask you, what are some of the remaining limitations uh, to the technology, if there are any? Oh, yeah, there's lots of limitations, lots of challenges, I would, you know, if you want to look at it in a positive way. <laughs> um, to give you an example, in the case of controlling these uh, computers, as I said, the, the, the way that you interface with it is through optical wires, optical channels. So you need to, you know, if you want, a thousand uh, qubits and a thousand atoms, uh, as well as they can be used, you need a thousand very low phase noise laser channels uh, that you can modulate at sort of gigahertz rates. That doesn't exist. You know, think about maybe a spatial light modulator, perhaps, would be great. Uh, if it could be modulated with sufficient precision, A, and speed, you know, gigahertz rather than kilohertz, as our today as today's spatial light modulators can repeat patterns at. So um, it doesn't exist. So that, that to me, that's a sh because it, it, it brings in this awesome photonics challenge, right? Um, we don't know what the best solution is. In my group, we're trying, you know, several different paths. And it's not clear which one is going to win out, but there are open challenges on this side. In, the, in another application space, in machine learning, you, you're seeing, since you're talking about computing, uh, in machine learning, uh, there is, you know, if you look at sort of the trend uh, of artificial neural network dimensions, which perhaps you could measure in terms of the number of uh, programmed parameters that it entails, right? It's exponential. The, basically, the more powerful, the more neural weight it needs to use. Um, so we're, we're getting to the point where just training these systems is requiring, you know, huge supercomputers. Uh, running for, you know, months on end uh, to train a neural network model, right? And then the, the computation, the inference problem itself on that is also pretty challenging. So there's an opportunity here for photonics to perhaps help in uh, solving some of the bottlenecks. And uh, and one of them in particular is if you can do, you know, matrix-matrix multiplication optically. It turns out you can do that in principle very, very efficiently, save a lot of time and energy, in neural network training, but also inference. But we're limited right now in, in how large an optical circuit we can build. Okay, so another example of where there's, you know, just another example of many where we have open challenge that are, um, that I think are driving a lot of engineering and um, innovation in the field. Dirk England, our guest from MIT. Uh, I want to move now to a, a material supply chain question for you. We, we've talked about graphene here. This isn't a graphene question, but I'll use it as an example. The view of those in the photonics industry of graphene has really changed. The infatuation has changed in the last 20 years. And so I want to ask you, get your thoughts on what the next super 2D material uh, on our radars ought to be as we move forward. Yeah, so I think in 3D materials, we're they're, we're seeing that they have properties that we don't have available in uh, in, in both materials uh, in many instances. Since you mentioned graphene, uh, some recent work pioneered by actually a colleague of mine at uh, MIT, uh, Professor Pablo Tivolo Herrero, two layers of graphene, and you put them at a right angle, what they call a magic angle. Then you create the sort of moray pattern, and that causes a perturbation in the electronic state in that material that induces superconductivity, an exotic form of superconductivity, and one, in fact, that theorists don't know how to predict. So that's an example of a sort of, as I say, like a magical property that we have in 2D materials that's, in fact, gatable. This is a superconductor you can turn on and off by just the back gate. That, that's, that's available in 2D materials that we don't have available in bulk materials, right? I mean, you, you mentioned the uh, bolometry work and so on. You can now go and think about doing this in other materials but you can also create these moray patterns with other, like transition metal dichocogenite materials, okay? But I would say, I'm not sure if there is the next amazing material, but for sure there, there almost certainly is, okay? So I don't want to say that, but what I think is equally needed is to develop methods to produce these materials uh, reliably, okay, with sufficient quality. And I think that we don't, in the field, we don't have that really yet. Even in graphene, which you said has been around for nearly 20 years or so, um, or isolated for 20 years, 
Uh, even there, the highest quality materials are still produced by exfoliation. We need to have a concerted effort on, A, production of really high quality material. And really, you know, that requires, like, a really, I think, a, a deep dive into the material science of assembly of the material and so on. And then, B, the production of it, right? For these materials to compete, uh, I think we need to, we need to master these capabil- these core capabilities, right? And, uh, there are some efforts sporadically that I know about here and there. Uh, but I think, you know, there's, there's maybe another place, an example for this kind of a industry government partnership to try to really tackle this hard material science challenge of efficient scale and quality. Derek, I want to thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, be well, stay safe, uh, and, and good science to you moving forward. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Jake. Today's episode is sponsored by MKS Instruments. We have you covered with our full portfolio of solutions in the areas of optics, photonics, lasers, vibration control, and precision motion control. Surround the Workpiece is an MKS offering that includes product design and development, system level integration, research and development, system, subsystem, and component selection, and maintenance, repair, and calibration services in the field of laser-based guidance and control for manufacturing processes. For more information about Surround the Workpiece, please visit www.newport.com. In a paper released in Nature Communications, researchers described the direct shaping of pulses in the terahertz range, where a diffractive device operating without an external pump successfully controlled the amplitude and phase of the input wavelengths. Here, at the intersection of machine learning and optics, the paper's authors outline in their abstract, quote, diffractive networks merge wave optics with deep learning to design task-specific elements to all optically perform various tasks, such as object classification and machine vision. A lot to unpack here, and here to discuss the paper is its co-author, Aidan Osjan, who joins us once again here on the podcast from UCLA. Hi, Jake. I, I want to ask you, to the extent possible, first and foremost, can you outline this recent work for us and, and shed some light on the significance of its outcome, the, the synthesization process of these arbitrary temporal waveforms? Sure. Uh, th- this work is, at the, as you very well uh, said, at the intersection of machine learning and optics. And it's using deep learning principles to design a black box, a passive black box that is composed of diffractive surfaces. These are layers where they are engineered at uh, at a scale that is on the order of wavelength uh, with different uh, heights um, on a layer, one layer following another layer following another layer. These layers are designed in this specific uh, paper's context to shape an input pulse uh, that is uh, entering this uh, diffractive system that's designed by deep learning into a desired temporal waveform. So it essentially uh, controls independently the uh, spectral amplitude and phase of the input wavelength so that at the output, as they're exiting the, the passive system composed of these diffractive layers, it picks up a certain temporal waveform that we wanted. So in a nutshell, it's a very compact device on the order of tens of wavelengths in the axial dimension. So it's a very compact pulse uh, shaping network that is formed with this design principle. It's passive. It doesn't consume any power except the input light. And it permits uh, direct modulation of both the amplitude and phase information of input wavelengths as they pass through this system so that we can achieve uh, pulse shaping. This could be useful for various different applications that use ultra short pulses all the way from telecommunications to uh, ultra fast imaging and spectroscopy. At different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, we need devices like this to shape, engineer our uh, temporal waveforms of radiation. Talked about the uh, terahertz range in the beginning, but you just mentioned it. It's the, it's really the rest of the electromagnetic spectrum where these possibilities are arising. Uh, I want to ask you: looking at diffractive optical networks that can process broadband sources, what possibilities does the work establish across the full of the spectrum? 
this, this framework enables us to actually engineer broadband radiation through these uh, uh, diffractive systems. And, and there are two mainstream applications that would benefit us to harness, uh, basically, you know, to utilize these, uh, these systems. One of them is uh, deterministic optical system design. For example, we can, using this framework, design uh, spectral filters. We can design pulse shapers, as we have described here, to engineer um, terahertz pulses, for example. We can also design wavelength division multiplexing systems where you take a broadband radiation and channel different subbands of it to different locations precisely depending on what you want to do. So all the way, as I said, from spectroscopy to telecommunications to imaging, uh, you can design black box deterministic optical systems depending on what you want to do. So this is an inverse design framework powered by deep learning that you know what you want to achieve and you have some maybe uh, physical insights how it's going to be done, but oftentimes those kinds of design principles yield suboptimal results. That's where data-driven, that's where uh, deep learning-driven designs will, will help us to come with non-intuitive to come up with non-intuitive designs for solving these deterministic optical system design problems. This, this is the first aspect where these types of broadband diffractive systems could be very useful. The second aspect is actually to perform statistical inference. Uh, for example, if you want to do image classification with broadband light, uh, we can actually engineer these diffractive systems to also perform some sort of uh, machine learning image classification where, for example, there are different classes of objects at the front end of a diffractive uh, system, diffractive surface uh, network, where uh, these different classes, um, based on which, which kind of an object you put in front of the diffractive system, it routes, for example, most of the photons to a particular detector at the output plane that corresponds to that data class. So that's the other very exciting aspect. We call them diffractive optical networks that learn, uh, that are trained through data, through image data, to do statistical inference, image classification, all the tasks that traditional electronic neural nets can perform, but all optically, meaning that as the light is passing through this diffractive network, it's actually calculating, for example, the class of the input image so that the output photons represent that class all optically by routing most of the photons. I then Ozjan with us. His latest paper is terahertz pulse shaping using diffractive surfaces. It appeared in Nature Communications. Let's talk about the tunability of diffractive pulse shaping, uh, or perhaps in general, diffractive optical processors. What can you tell us about that? Sure. I think uh, one aspect of these diffractive systems, uh, which is an advantage and a disadvantage, is that they're passive, meaning that unless you do something special by, for example, using spatial light modulators or reconfigurable surfaces, these systems are designed in a computer and then they're fabricated. For example, in this work that is published recently in Nature Communications, we use a standard 3D printer to print these diffractive layers and then you have this compact network sitting in front of you as a passive, without any pa external power system that you can use to shape pulses. That's an advantage. It's a compact and, and passive network, but that's also a disadvantage in the sense that uh, it's fixed. Uh, it's, uh, it's static in, in, its, uh, in its calculation, in its shaping, engineering of pulses, for example. So one way to bring some tunability to the system we've explored is actually layer-to-layer -layer distances uh, that you can modulate. So imagine these uh, sequence of diffractive surfaces that are separated from each other by, let's say, a few tens of wavelengths, and that forms the, the pulse shaping network. We've seen that actually by shrinking or expanding this layer-to-layer -layer separation, you can tune very effectively the pulse width or the center frequency of, of a filter that you can design with this kind of a network. So that brings us some reconfigurability without the need for an additional fabrication or 3D printing step, which is, I think, uh, uh, very exciting. Another um, uh, way to take these fabricated networks and have them tunable features is actually what we call uh, transfer, physical transfer learning. 
Uh, what I mean by that is basically you take those, let's say, five diffractive surfaces as part of a network. And let's say you want to change its function. You want to change the output pulse shape to a new pulse shape. Instead of printing another diffractive uh, network from scratch, what we do is you can take, for example, the last two diffractive layers, take them out, and replace them with new printed diffractive layers, new fabricated diffractive layers, and form a Lego-like uh, transfer to patch the existing uh, layers uh, so that you can kind of mend the function of the uh, diffractive surface by these additional layers that are trained and fabricated. So these are giving us some different physical means to tune the, the function, the processing capabilities of these diffractive networks. And, uh, and I think that's uh, helping us to mitigate some cases where either you want to change the, for example, the output pulse shape, or sometimes the input pulse shape that you assumed might change depending on the status of your input radiation. All of these kinds of changes can be tolerated through these types of tunability and physical repair mechanisms for the refractor. That does it for this episode of All Things Photonics. Thank you to our engineer, Alan Shepard, and to Joel Williams with the news. Our featured music is courtesy of betterwithmusic.com. Most of all, thank you, our listeners. As always, you can share your thoughts, pitch us ideas, let us know how we're doing. You can reach us at all things at photonics.com. All Things Photonics is available on all major platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, as well as on our website. Subscribe, never miss an episode. I'm Jake Saltzman. This has been a Photonics Media Production.